growing weary of running from room to room, practicing one-tooth insurance-driven dentistry? Then stay tuned for the latest episode of The Lionhearted, where Dr. Stephen Rasner will hand you the blueprint for what many call the gold standard of general practice dentistry. Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Steve Rasner. Welcome to a rainy Sunday afternoon where it's just me and you talking about ways to improve our practice. I'll say at the start, if you want to email me, please do so, so I know you're listening, at Dr. Rasner, no period, D-R-R-A-S-N-E-R -R -E at AOL. Pretty easy to remember. And uh, anyway, listen, I've now been doing this for about six months. I've delivered many episodes. And I hope you understand that I... And I've said this many times, and I'm just one fellow clinician who's doing this because he wants to, because I want to impart some gems and uh, pearls to you, whether it's practice management or whether it's clinical, whether it's advice on what road you might want to take, what courses you may want to take. And I base this on a history of mine that has worked out pretty well for me over the, not always, but a lot of times it has. So that's what this really is for me. I'm also hoping to meet some of you, take some of my courses, which you can find at the rasnerinstitute.com. And there you'll see my speaking uh, calendar and uh, including uh, courses I give in my office live on surgical skills, traumatic extractions, implants, and site preparation. So enough of all that, you know, of all the things I've tried to share with you, and I realize that there's an earlier episode on what I'm going to talk about today, and you could go back to that and compare notes or just listen to this one, because I don't think you could ever hear it enough. What I want you to hear is if I had one podcast to give you that I think can most make the greatest impact on your career, your professional life, and, and in a way, even your personal life, because there's so many professional benefits to doing what I'm about to do, is I want you to re-listen today to my thoughts on the oral sedation practice. Don't turn me off. Even if you don't do surgery, it's an enormous benefit to your practice, particularly the protocol I'm going to give you. So I really thought about it before I came on today, of all the things I've discussed, and without a doubt, that's number one. So let's go over it again. And let's be clear from the beginning, you can't compare and say you're doing sedation to what I'm doing unless you're using my exact protocol. Let me secondly say, uh, you can't do this legally without checking with your state board of dentistry. If you're in Canada, it's a Royal Canadian College. Uh, I don't know what it is in Europe, but I'm not here to advocate you break the law. It is uh, a permit that you need to have. In the United States, it's usually needed and required if you dispense more than one, in, uh, one drug at a time. And indeed, this is counting nitrous oxide, it's four drugs. So stepping back, the, let's get right to it. What are the medications I use and, and why? The medications I use are 50 milligrams of Atarax, 25 milligrams of uh, Benadryl, and 0.25 of uh, triazolam. Now, why those? One, two of them are antihistamines. Well, because the antihistamine Atarax has an anti-anxiety component associated with taking it. And Benadryl just makes them drowsy and sleepy. And triazolam, of course, is a benzodiazepine in that family. So here's the thing. I've done it for 22 plus years. 
So I want you to think of the perfect sedation cocktail that somebody um, could come up with. And by the way, all the credit goes to a tremendous dentist from Alabama named Dr. John Hoare. He was just a good friend of mine and I was fortunate to have met him 20 some years ago, I think at this point. And John just is one of these amazing clinicians, like many of you listening, I'm sure, that maybe not a lot of people except in his community even know about. But John imparted this cocktail to me years ago. Um, by the way, he used to fly up from Alabama and teach me things. And in exchange, I would teach him practice management and how I, and all the other caveats I thought I had from designing this practice that so many people knew about in a part of the United States that was economically very challenged. So that's how it happened. But if you could come up with the perfect cocktail, think about this. It lasts about four hours. It takes about 90 minutes to have its effect. So I wish that could, and by the way, I've experimented with certain other uh, pharma companies to see if we could come up with a similar sequence of medications that would kick in quicker. And I haven't been able to do that. I thought we were on the cusp of that many times, but as we speak today, in the spring of 2019, it's really the only thing I've come up with, and I've tried many combinations. So it's very different if you give out 20 milligrams of Valium. And it's different than any other combination, and I've given many. So imagine within 90 minutes or less, I don't think it's gonna be less than 60 minutes, you will have a patient in a zone of what I would call purring as in snoring. That's what it sounds like. Almost all of them get into this zone where they are um, literally snoring at a very pleasant, soft purr, I would call it. So number one, that's the combination that I've experimented with, not experimented with, that I've used for 22 years. Now here's the second thing. I've used it without incident. It's, I've never had an untoward reaction, not once by giving the recommended dose that I told you about just now. So there's three pills that are dispensed uh, and they take them 90 minutes before. So I'm gonna do this podcast today with the typical questions that come up in an audience when I'm speaking and talking about it. So number one, where do you train? I always hear that. Where do you train to learn how to do this? And the answer is, there's no specific set of courses to train for what I just said to you. What you need is a permit from your state that permits more than one medication to be dispensed um, when you're uh, sedating your patients. And I can tell you, I believe in New Jersey and in many states, the requirement is 60 initial hours of training on various uh, pharmacology, um, life support, uh, just the things you would think that would go along with sedating a patient. Uh, in some states, I understand, they require you to get an IV sedation license, even though we are just, um, we are just dispensing oral medication here. In some states, it has become mandatory that you get an IV, and I got news for you, it is such a positive impact on my practice and on yours that I would do whatever they said. If I had to go back and take a five day or a couple month course on IV sedation to continue to dispense these medications, I would. Uh, so the set, another question that I commonly hear uh, is, what do I charge for? Now this may be very controversial, what I'm about to tell you, but I don't charge for it, including even nitrous oxide. Here's how I look at it. And remember, you're getting one clinician's opinion on these podcasts, and this is something that's worked very well for me. 
So the pills, and we've done, you know, the calculations, the three pills that I just alluded to um, come to about $8. So that's really not a major expense, of course. So the question is, is and you need nitrous oxide, and I'll elaborate the, on this in just a second. Um, and of course, nitrous is far from inexpensive. But in my office, and, and this is a conversation for another podcast, you know, I believe that you should create a fee structure that is created in such a way that it protects you or allows you to do the things I just said. So in other words, I am far from the Kmart or the bed and bath of dental practices. Um, people pay fees that are moderate to high probably for my services like they do for any of you listening that have dedicated a, a career to training at the highest level. You just can't do all that and give it away unless you're in a uh, nonprofit situation of an organization. So when you, to me, I find it kind of interesting because a patient will often pay you in today's world of dentistry, they'll often pay you 10,000, 15, 20 above for a treatment plan and yet really appreciate that the sedation portion of the practice is at no cost. So that's one man's opinion. I don't charge for it and haven't over the 22 years. Okay, let's get back to specifics because you don't just give them three pills, sprinkle some fairy dust and they're out. It's kind of like that, but there's some other things that you need to know. So let's back it up a little bit and go over a patient from the very beginning. So number one, you're gonna to want to know what medications they're presently on. So this is one of the protocols. So what we do is we have a relationship with a number of pharmacists in our area, and there's apps that you can get on your phone or your computer where you could do this firsthand and see if there's any cross um, reaction between giving Benadryl, Atarax, Triazolam, and whatever medication your patient's on. So you could just use an app to do that. We just find it routine, and it's worked for us for years, to call up uh, a pharmacist that we have a relationship with, and that's not every pharmacist, and they're kind of prepared for our conversations, and ask them, uh, given the, the history that the patient's on with medications, is there any cross uh, reactivity that we have to be concerned about? And I have to tell you that in 20 some years of doing this, I've had a couple patients who had an allergy to Benadryl, but beyond that, nothing. I've never been actually denied based on that. The second part of that equation to keep this safe and predictable, and remember, I've never had an incident, not one untoward incident in 22 plus years of prescribing this if we followed the protocol. Um, by the way, I've, I had to call 911 once because I packed too much cord that had epi in it on a patient for Crown and Bridge. That was 30 years ago. But never for administering the drugs I just alluded to you that I've, that I've recommended. Okay. So the second part of that, of course, is the medical evaluation or medical history. You know, what if you have an ASA 3 patient? Well, first of all, it's the course of another discussion, but I'm a big advocate of my colleagues trying in, to refine their practice to ASA 1s and ASA 2s. I mean, I have a pretty successful practice just based on those kind of patients. It's not to say I've never worked on an ASA 3, but I don't think that should be a major segment of the patients you work on. And so most of our patients are either healthy or are healthy given the medications they've been taking to control their diabetes, their hypertension, um, whatever systemic issues they may have. But that being said, if there's even, this should be your protocol, if there's even the slightest hesitation in your gut 
then get a medical clearance. And by the way, I have a terrific, pretty up-to-date medical clearance form that if you wrote to me, Dr. Rasner at AOL, I will have Beth, our assistant, mail it out to you. It's pretty up-to-date, used by many reputable organizations that teach surgery around the United States. Okay. So let's assume that you have the medical clearance, there's no cross-reactivity, uh, you've, how do you dispense the drug? Big question always comes to me. How do we give it and when? Do I write a prescription? That would probably be the most um, safe way to do it. Uh, it isn't the way we've been doing it for years. We actually package them in a small envelope with instructions. And once the patient has agreed to the treatment plan, it's been signed and I'm convinced this case is going forward, the finances have been taken care of, we actually dispense it to the patient. Now, what's the negative of that? Well, the negative to that would be, what if they take the pills at home? I had somebody call me, not call me, but write to me from these podcasts that said his patient fell asleep at home. Nothing serious, he just fell asleep. And when the ride appeared to pick them up, they didn't wake up or hear the ride. And that has happened to me two times in 22 years. So it's not like unheard of. You want to be 100% safe. You could either make sure they come to the office 90 minutes before and dispense the pills there. And I would do that if they were elderly or even borderline, which you considered frail medically. And again, I repeat, if they're actually really frail, they're an SAS3, I wouldn't do the case. And I certainly wouldn't medicate them. And while we're on it, what about children? Well, uh, as I kid about in my presentations, I've done the research on uh, children, on how these medications should be used, and I'm completely convinced after a couple years of researching it that the way, the most predictable and safe way to treat a child is not to treat them with sedation. So I don't sedate kids. So the next question to you should be, okay, then what's a kid? Well, to me, a kid is 17 or under, a body weight under 90 pounds. Obviously, this is not hard science. It is based on antidotal evidence of mine of two decades. So I really don't, I, I would rather send to the oral surgeon a patient that's an ASA3 to be worked in a hospital setting. I'd rather send, it, uh, send a child to a, a, a pediatric dentist or a facility better equipped to handle any problems that they may have. Um, you know, that being said, I have had discussions with, uh, and I'm not changing my view on that, I don't think you should sedate children, end of story. Not on my protocol. Um, but it is incredibly safe. I mean, I think the most, the number one untoward event that would happen is that they would have to sleep it off. Now, there are reversal agents. Flumazenol is a reversal agent, but it has to be given IV. Again, by the way, write to me at Dr. Rasner at AOL, and Beth can send you this protocol. Um, it's all written out. Um, they're going to come to you and arrive in one of three states when you do this. Um, they will be... 80% of the time, perfectly sedated for dental work for you. What does that mean? They can walk back from your reception room. They're a little tipsy, giddy. They sit in your chair. You put nitrous on them, and we'll speak about the nitrous now. That patient I just described that would, do, that would be in that setting, I would put on 20% nitrous. I would range from 20 to 35%. And I will tell you, they will, that by the way, we bring them into an operatory where the lights are out uh, to continue the sedative experience. 
Uh, not much talking do I like in the room or in a quiet tone. I, these seem obvious to you, but even in my own office, somebody's being loud, like, and my doors are all open, and the patient can, you know, these patients, even if they're sleeping, you should assume that they can hear you, because sometimes they can. And in a, within 10 minutes, that turns into either a sleep or some kind of snore, and that's how I know we're ready to administer anesthetic. Now that's 80%. I would say 10% will be sleeping in your reception room when you go to bring them back. For that reason, if you do this, you need a wheelchair. Um, wheelchair is not expensive. Uh, you can buy one on eBay or Amazon. And that patient, we're only gonna use O2 on we're not gonna use any nitrous. And again, I know I've said this many times already in this podcast, but you know, I've never had a patient that was so out of it that I, I was concerned, I had to call 911, anything like that. And that's, you know, that's using one triazolam um, a great majority of the time, although the last category I'm about to tell you about. I would say it's accurate to tell you that 10, 10%, so it's 80% are perfectly sedated, 10% are actually excellent also, you just don't need any nitrous. And another 10% will tell you, I thought you said I'd be asleep. They're almost contentious about it. I, and it's universal by the way, I'm not kidding. When they don't get the effect that they wanted it's like they're angry at you. So this is an important part of this podcast because this is how you handle that. I would tell you that patient, and they're, they're clear speaking to you, um, and it's obvious they're not out. Their eyes are wide open. They're probably on their phone, which you should discourage or not permit. Um, they may have come in. Remember, these patients are, have a history a big time fear with the dentist. So a lot of them will have a significant other or a friend ask for, with requesting that they can sit in the corner till you begin. So they may be talking to that person. Um, this is all not good. Okay, here's what you do. You first up the nitrous oxygen combination to 50%. It probably won't work. If it doesn't work, you can give them a second triazolam crushed under their tongue. Not, the, not an extra Benadryl, not an extra Atarax, just triazolam crushed under their tongue. Now you do that under their tongue because it bypasses the GI and accelerates the onset of the uh, medication. And within 15 minutes, I would say 80% of that 10% will then be snoring and they'll be ready to, to be uh, worked on. Um, so that leaves 20% of those patients. Um, in my career, I have prob career being 22 years of sedation, I have probably given less than five patients a third triazolam. And I would advocate that you don't do that. That, you know, sometimes, yes, it doesn't work. Sometimes, um, I mean, the sometime percentage we're talking about is incredibly low. I'm going to tell you how I manage that too with the, with the patient that seems like it could be a big challenge. So let me just re re um, summarize this for you. Your basic go-to is the Atarax, Benadryl, Triazolam. Not alone. You have to have, those of you that don't have nitrous in your office, it's a perfect question to ask me right now. So what do you do? Do you put in plumbing for $8,000 to have it in all your rooms? Or maybe you're renting space that you don't want to invest that type of plumbing or you can't? I would get a portable system from uh, any of a number of places. You know, the kind that has the two E-tanks right on the um, 
I don't know what you call it, that you wheel it from room to room. It's a portable nitrous administration machine and it has the tanks right on it. That's what I used for probably 10 years before I had it plumbed throughout my office. So they're not, ex they're not inexpensive. I mean, you're talking about a 35 to $4,500 investment, maybe even more. But that's what I would do. Listen, those of you to go to the trouble of getting this permit, I am telling you, I've never met anybody that came back to me. Maybe they're out there and I never heard from them. That said, oh, that was a waste. It didn't work the way you said. And this, I, I now I'm stuck with a, a nitrous uh, machine as well. You're not going to say that to me. And it's a good investment, by the way, anyway, even if you don't do the rest of the sedation um, protocol. So those of you, I would not go out and plumb my whole office right away. Um, uh, yeah, I actually would do that. But those of you that aren't in a position to do that, get yourself a portable um, nitrous administration machine and you'll be just fine. Another question I get is, well, because I've stated that we used to do IV in my office and we still do at times. So another question I ask is, why do, I, why do this then? This is a good question. Why do this if you can do IV? And the answer is this. In some respects, it's more effective and easier to work with than IV sedation. And we all know that IV sedation training is a tremendous commitment. Let me just tell you right now what I would do. If it was me and I was pondering where to take my office with regards to all the things I'm talking about and I wanted to do IV, I would look into a portable IV company that comes around a, I don't, I'm not, a mobile IV uh, organization and they're in most states. I think they're in all states. We have one in New Jersey and that's what I would do before I would invest the time and money personally to be trained in IV sedation for your work. I don't like the concept of having to control not only the dental patient and their care, but also, and I know those of you that do IV probably think this is ridiculous. Well, you're a very select group of dentists. And for most dentists, the sage advice, trust me on this, is either hire somebody to do that for you, which I've done many, many times, so you can focus on the patient's care, um, or you know, try the oral sedation protocol that I'm talking about, because I've done both. And I can tell you that it's, it's for me, it's easier to manage the patient and the dentistry by far doing what I'm suggesting in this podcast. And another thing is, is I don't know that you can market, which we haven't gotten to the advantages of, and that's how I'll close this podcast. I don't know that you can market IV sedation. You're certainly not going to do it at no cost. So I don't know that it's even as marketable. Plus, there are some people, clearly we all know this, that are petrified of having the needle stuck in their arm, you know, for the IV uh, sedation. So let's go back now and start talking about, well, what are the, what is the impact that I keep alluding to, the profound impact? In fact, I would so believe in this that I made a second podcast about it. For those of you that are just joining my podcast for the first time, or those of you that want to go back and search, one of my very first podcasts in this series was on oral sedation. Well, number one, there is no learning curve. Think about that for a minute. What else, what other skill do you administer where there isn't a learning curve? In other words, the first time you dispense the medications that I'm talking about, you'll be as good as I am 22 years into it. There is nothing else that you do that works like that because it's a pharmacological event. It's not really a skill event. Yes, there is wisdom involved in choosing a right patient, uh, thinking a patient's had enough, and that th is a factor. You know you, you know, you may be two and a half hours into a case, and maybe you're planning to do something else. And there's many times I thought, just based on my uh, clinical experience in life, 
professionally that this patient has had enough. That's something I often do. But in terms of an ability to have somebody become sedated, there's no learning curve. So it's pretty sweet. Number two is you can market it. I mean, think about this for a minute. Even your beautiful aesthetic dentistry that you do. A lot of people that you do aesthetics on um, don't want to tell other people that they just had their teeth done. So even when you've knocked it out of the park and have this gorgeous case you're looking at, you know, will you get referrals from that? Yeah, you'll get people very close in, the, in a that were in a close group to this patient that you just treated. Yeah, their inner circle. You'll get that over time if they need your kind of work. But overall, it doesn't make your phone blow up. What about if you became great at ortho or endo? I do think you should become great at six month smiles or uh, Invisalign or of course endo. But that doesn't make your phone blow up and neither can you market the heck out of it? But the one thing that you can market the heck out of, that everybody is comfortable telling other people that they found a dentist that doesn't hurt. Well, not only did they find a dentist that doesn't hurt with us, they find a dentist that you can sleep through the procedure. Now, we're not allowed in New Jersey to, to market it as sleep dentistry, but indeed, that is what's going on. I have many videos to prove that. A nice light sleep while you get your work done. So you can market it. And I will tell you in a very short time, you're going to have a significant influx of patients. You know, I always say this when I present. I don't own a red Corvette, but I've been told that if you buy a red Corvette, all of a sudden you see red Corvettes there out on the road. Well, Right now you're thinking, do I really have the market for this in Southern Alabama or Southern California or Northern North Dakota? You own this skill. You own, you get the permit. You start marketing and I'll gladly send you a, co a couple copies of what I've used to market it. I've marketed it for 20 years and you will indeed get people in your communities. I don't care where you're at or if you're in Europe or China or Japan, there are people in your community who need a dentist that has the skill that I'm trying to get you to acquire. Trust me. And it is profound. It is not unique to me in southern New Jersey. So marketing, scheduling becomes incredibly easier for your team because you're not going to bring somebody in uh, and do a DO on a premolar filling generally Generally, the type of patients that you're going to attract are patients that have had a long history of fear. And they will tell you that many people have failed in their sedation attempts. Well, they didn't have the cocktail that I'm giving you. They might have failed with 10 milligrams of Valium. I guess that's true. That's not what we're using. And so uh, you're going to get people who have put off the needs because we all know that we chose a profession, you and I, where things don't have to hurt that are wrong. So when you have this patient that maybe came in, their last dental visit was six years ago because they had to go. And maybe the one before that was seven years before that. And you're going to get patients like this from 18 years old to 80 years old. You write it down, hold me to it, it's going to happen. And they're going to have a myriad of pathology that you're going to have to treat. So it becomes incredibly, uh, an, an incredible uh, source of patience for you as a dentist. It becomes a, an incredible magnet to bring in patients who have a lot of dental needs for you to treat. And, uh, and you know, the best part about it is, is that you're going to be successful and they are going to be a sounding board for your practice. It, it is an amazing practice builder, unlike anything else I could ever give you in any of these podcasts. If this was the only one I would do, it would be dedicated to 
boosting your practice through oral sedation. Now, some final takeaways. Although it's not mandatory, it would be a good skill for you to take in addition to that on how to extract teeth atraumatically. And I'm not referring to wisdom teeth. I refer all my wisdom teeth to my oral surgeon because not because I can't do them, because I can. Because I find a, uh, it's a poor return on investment. In other words, the possible morbidity associated with taking out lower third molars, and I'm not gonna take out the uppers and refer the lowers to my oral surgeon. That's just nasty and mean. But the morbidity associated with, because the an anatomy that's present in the third molar mandibular area just isn't worth it. So the surgical skills that I'm talking about are mesial to the third molars. So if you could learn that, it would be great. But even if you didn't do that, even if you didn't, and you just did extensive crown and bridge or root canal or skills like this, it's a practice changer. It's a, it's a way for you to relax. I mean, imagine, I'm going to leave it at this today. Picture in your head going to work. It's like, I'm going to go tomorrow morning. It's a Sunday that I'm speaking to you too. too. I have an 8.30 patient for an extraction of 14 and an implant. I will tell you, I'm a history of root canal. It's going to break off the gingival margin. Remember, I teach a course on the atraumatic extraction in my office. So that's exactly how to get those teeth out. And atraumatic is defined as leaving all five walls of bone so that you can graft it or place an implant and graft it. But I won't, be, I won't be nervous a little bit. I'll be actually look forward to it. I'll walk in, the room will be dark. There'll be some cool, calm music playing in that room. Um, by the time I get in there, the patient will be anesthetized. It'll almost like be practicing in an operating room. And I don't know my schedule by heart tomorrow, but I guarantee you from 20 years of doing this type of stuff that there'll probably be a couple other patients like that tomorrow. I won't be seeing 20 plus patients to make my living or to be a dentist or to do dentisting as my friend Paul Goodman says. No, that's I used to do that many, many moons ago. I would judge how busy or great my day was by how many patients I saw. These days are long going. This is a long, hard road. And one of my goals for you with these podcasts is to make it as easy as I can. And one way to do that would be for you to seriously consider adapting an oral sedation protocol to your practice. And it doesn't mean you have to be 100%, but it probably will end up being somewhere like 50% over a matter of a couple years. I hope this inspired some of you. I hope some of you will write to me at Dr. Rasner at AOL. And I thank you for letting me be a part of your journey. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you next time.